We are take a look now at the balance of power theory and its underlying components, alliances, and some of the controversies within it that explain war and peace. First, we examine alliances, which are the building blocks of balance of power mechanics. Balance of power is a theory that predicts peace rather than war, but contradicts rational deterrence theory by arguing that most conflict is not dyadic. It's not between two states, but rather involves the community of states. Now, alliance theory is very important because it provides the building blocks of the balance of power mechanic. So the essential focus question is, are alliances a cause of war or peace? Now, states, to strengthen themselves against external threats, can pursue one of two strategies, according to Kenneth Waltz. The first is internal balancing. A country can build internal resources, such as weapons, but this is very often very expensive. Uh, for example, uh, the arms race, engaged in by the U.S. and the Soviet Union during the Cold War, was both an attempt to use their internal resources uh, to strengthen um, their ability to intervene and protect their allies. The declining effect of power over distance is, as I mentioned earlier, measured by the loss of strength gradient. So here's a very simple uh, graphic representation of it. You can see how a wealthy state has a much longer reach than a poor state. So military force allows states to, if they have to go to war, they can go to war farther out from their territory and not inside their territory. And here you can see the intersection between the red loss of strength gradient and a green loss of strength gradient between states A and B. Now state B has got an aircraft carrier, so th they can pass the geographic midline and extend their power even farther uh, to the crossover point. And so we would expect conflict to occur at that crossover point. Another type of balancing is external balancing. Here, states make external alliances with other states against the main threat. But this entails a different kind of cost. For example, the formation by uh, the United States of NATO during the Cold War was an instrument that was used to try to block the threat of an attack by the Soviet Union. You can also see in this picture a depiction of the blue which are the Western Allies, the red, which is the Soviet Union and its Communist Allies, uh, against the Axis forces of Japan, Italy, and Germany during the Second World War. So you have two large alliances here, uh, but ultimately uh, broke into another two alliances between, uh, again, rather confrontations between red and blue at the end of the Second World War. Now, according to Stephen Walt, States exhibit two generally different types of alliance behavior. The first is balance against power. This means you oppose uh, a country that threatens you, and it's based on the enemy's power. And you basically join other countries that also recognize that threat as a common threat, and so an alliance is formed. Balance of power is powerful because it's so parsimonious. It seems to work. We think of the case of Communist China and the USSR. The US foreign policy was always to limit the confrontation against Communist China in the hope that eventually it would turn against the Soviet Union. The argument against that was, here you had two states with the same communist ideology. They're supposed to be cooperating fraternally, um, working together. But in the end, US foreign policy was more correct. The U.S. assumed that balance of power mechanics would eventually cause these two powerful neighboring countries to turn in on each other, and that policy uh, turned out to be a great success, and it was based on sound theory. Walt also uh, has a second uh, type of uh, proposal for balance, which is balance against threat. And here Walt argues that states prioritize balancing against power but they will also balance against ideological threats once their basic security is taken care of. And number three, this explains why coalitions tend to be overwhelming and not rationally a minimum winning coalition. Now we saw that countries 
want to minimize the amount of resources they spend on security. So countries are, are going to therefore rationally look for a minimum winning coalition because in a smaller coalition they have to compromise less, they have a, a greater uh, proportion of control over policy, and if the coalition wins anything they get a larger share of the pie. But uh, with an overwhelming coalition, of course, they're much more powerful. And in many cases, there are overwhelming coalitions because countries uh, gather together on the basis of ideology. During the Second World War, uh, Nazi Germany was heavily outnumbered because a great many states that wanted simple things like free commerce got involved in the war against Germany. For example, Brazil deployed two divisions of soldiers to fight alongside the Allies in the Italian campaign uh, during the Second World War. So, uh, Brazil balanced against the threat. And so you had this uh, very large overwhelming coalition, which wasn't rational from the sense of looking for the minimum winning coalition, meaning the, the smallest possible coalition you need to win. Uh, in fact, we had an overwhelming coalition. So Stephen Waltz, uh, a balance of threat has four variables. One is the uh, aggregate power which is basically uh, balancing against a threat. Uh, geographic proximity, the closer you are to the threat, the more likely you are to oppose it. Whether the threat has offensive power, meaning the ability to expand, perhaps through uh, uh, offensive maneuver capabilities. And the fourth variable is its aggress aggressive intentions. And uh, Walt argues that aggressive intentions are very important and neglected by balance of power. So it's basically balance of power, which is incredibly simple and parsimonious versus balance of threat, which is more complicated. Where balance of power would predict a minimum winning coalition, the balance of threat is able to explain why we have occasionally overwhelming coalitions. Another behavior is bandwagoning. Bandwagoning is a metaphor of elections in the American West uh, two centuries ago when farmers would come into town during an election period and wouldn't have time to assess the candidate so they would simply look at the wagon going back and forth and see how many people were on which wagon and they would vote for the wagon with the most people in it assuming that that was a good representation of which politician deserved to get the vote because the the farmer wasn't really connected to the politics of what was going on in the urban area in international relation, relations it means to join with the threat in other words you submit to the major threatening country so that you do not appear to be a threat to them and that you therefore hope that you do not become the target of their attack. This strategy is typically pursued when the state is too weak to resist and there is no prospect of finding allies. Now the classic example is Finland uh, at the end of the uh, Second World War. Finland bandwagoned with the Soviet Union. It simply was too weak to fight the Soviet Union off. It, and there were no allies in the region. Sweden did not want to ally with Finland against the Soviet Union. So Finland submitted. It basically agreed to buy Soviet equipment. It didn't join NATO. And it adopted a security policy that was in no way a threat to the USSR. Now we can consider uh, countries and ask whether they're balancing or bandwagoning. Is Canada balancing it against an external threat? in conjunction with the US? Or is Canada bandwagoning with the US because of the US's overwhelming strength? Or is it a combination of both? There's also the phenomenon of the management alliance. This is when a country allies to contain a potential threat. The classic example is the US and Japan, Japanese alliance uh, during the Cold War and since the end of the Cold War. Japan and the US were each militarily more powerful than China, so they couldn't be balancing in the 1950s. So the idea was that the US uh, allied with Japan to restrain Japan, make it secure, and this made other countries in the region that were American allies more secure. So that Taiwan, the Philippines, South Korea, Australia were more secure because the US was able to engage Japan in an alliance. And so Japan didn't have to build up a big military. And so all the US allies and the US and Japan were better off. One of the hypotheses that Walt con confirms is that ideology only has a temporary effect on alignment. Even states with similar ideologies will eventually succumb to balancing uh, behavior. So management alliance is a way of uh, trying to extend 
that uh, common uh, liberal ideology in the case of the U.S. and uh, uh, Japan. But as I mentioned earlier, countries with the same ideology can turn on each other, like communist USSR and China. Another example are the uh, Ba'ath political parties that were present in both Iraq and Syria led to a legitimacy crisis that led to a border conflict in the late 1970s between the two states. There is an additional type of bandwagoning behavior which is elaborated on by Randall Schweller. Some states are offensive bandwagoners in the sense that they side with the stronger side in a war in order to have the opportunity to reap some benefits or spoils from that war. Uh, similar to the way jackals will benefit by waiting for a lion to kill uh, um, an animal and then they will join the lion and uh, you know, partake in some of the, uh, the food. So this is termed jackal bandwagoning. It tends to occur at the end of wars when the outcome is far more certain. Very often Italy's participation with Germany in World War II against France was seen as jackal bandwagoning. Italy didn't join the war at the outset. It basically waited until Germany was winning decisively against France in 1940 and then Italy intervened in an attack uh, against the uh, French uh, in the Mediterranean. We can also see how Brazil joined at the end of World War II with the US, although Brazil was not joined, did not participate in World War II in order to achieve territorial gain. It did it so that it could have influence on the international system after the end of the war. An additional three set of behaviors was formulated by John Mearsheimer, who writes within the offensive realist tradition. Buck passing is a strategy to politically maneuver a threat, an enemy state, to attack another state. And the other state is termed the buck catcher. The classic example is the competition between the Soviet Union and the Western allies of England and France during the Second World War to get Germany to attack the other state. <clears throat> Ultimately, the Soviet Union prevailed when in the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, uh, in exchange for German technology to the Soviet Union and Soviet oil to Germany, the Soviet Union managed to get the Germans to attack France and not attack the Soviet Union at the beginning of the war. The Soviet Union did this because they suspected it was a long-term plan of England and France to get Germany caught in a long war against the Soviet Union. The second technique is the bait and the bleed. This is to arrange for threats to fight each other. A classic example here is the Iran-Iraq War. There was evidence that the United States had provided satellite information of the Iranian military to the Iraqis and the US thereby encouraged Iraq to get into a long war with Iran so that the, uh, the Iraqis would bear the burden of having to absorb all the revolutionary energy from Iran. There is also evidence that Iran did the same thing. It encouraged the Western states when they intervened on behalf of Kuwait after Iraq's invasion on August 2nd, 1990. Uh, Iran maneuvered in a strategy to try to get the other states to destroy Iraq so that Iran would benefit from a weaker Iraq once the war was over. And the third technique is bloodletting. It's to get other states to fight each other in a long war. And so it would be the conclusion of the bait and bleed technique. Uh, it's then to get the countries to stay at war for a very long time. And uh, this is what the US and its Western allies tried to do in the Iran-Iraq war, to keep Iraq in the conflict, to check Iran. And it worked for a decade. However, alliances have various mechanics that participant states must keep in mind, some of which may lead to dysfunctions. Much of the work here is done by Glenn Snyder. The first dilemma is burden sharing. Every alliance must have some agreement on the distribution of the burden. Since not all agreements are fair, how do you try to balance out the inequities of an agreement? 
During the Second World War, the Soviet Union bore a greater share in defeating Nazi Germany than did England. Right? And so the Soviet Union would occasionally threaten to try to make a separate peace, although that was very unlikely. So the British and Americans tried their best to show that they were committed to participating in the war so that the Soviet Union didn't have to bear uh, the burden of confronting most of the um, Nazi German military in the Soviet Union. If you don't specify the distribution of the burden, you could get a dysfunction called free riding, <clears throat> also called buck passing. Free riding or buck passing in an alliance occurs when one alliance partner calculates it can contribute less to an alliance because other states have less of a choice. The country I'm thinking about here, of course, is Canada, which has consistently provided relatively little to NATO's defense starting in the late 1960s, knowing that the United States and Germany simply couldn't reduce their contributions. However, when free riding occurs among major states in an alliance, there's the threat of departure and the collapse of the alliance. Now, because Germany would not commit to Italian interests in the First World War, Italy defected from its alliance with Germany and in fact joined the English and French side. So in World War I, Italy fought with England and France. And in World War II, it fought with Germany. Now, the statistical evidence is that most alliances are reliable and actually abandonment is fairly rare. Another consideration in alliances is the commitment problem. To keep states from distancing or defecting from their alliance and joining the enemy, which is term, termed abandonment, allies must demonstrate commitment, or what's also called binding. This can be done by stationing troops in your allies' territory. If the enemy attacks, you will automatically be at war with the enemy. During most of the Cold War and into the 1990s, but not currently, the U.S. stationed the 2nd Division in the Weijangbu Corridor, which is the main corridor from North Korea to the South Korean capital of Seoul. So if North Korea ever attacked South Korea, the first force they would encounter on the main route of advance would be the U.S. So the U.S. was committed to the war. Another consideration is chain ganging. This comes from the concept of prisoners chained together. So if one prisoner falls, all the other prisoners are brought down also. So this is an inverse problem. If a state is too closely committed to an ally, the ally might drag that state into a war against its choosing. This is termed entrapment. Germany in the First World War was desperate to have an ally. Its main prospect for a reliable ally was Austria-Hungary. But Austria-Hungary was undergoing domestic dis collapse. In particular, the various different identity groups within the empire wanted to secede. So when Austria-Hungary ended up in a dispute with Serbia, Germany had no choice. It had to cooperate and support Austria-Hungary because if it didn't, Austria-Hungary would either collapse or it would drift away and look for another ally. So Germany, desperate for allies, allowed itself in one interpretation to be dragged into the First World War over a dispute between its ally and Serbia. So a minor issue in the Balkans became a major cause of the First World War. There's also defensive chain ganging. Here, you can restrain a country from going to war that otherwise would have by uh, engaging in, um, uh, uh, in, in a defensive alliance with it. So what are some of the implications? Well, the main implication is on the collective action problem. This is a theory by economist Mansur Olson. Organizing group of states to cooperate together becomes exponentially more complex because of a number of problems. The first one is the calculation problem. Coordination costs increase with the number of states in an alliance. You know, imagine if there's a war between two countries and you have to bet which country would win. Imagine then a third country becomes involved. It becomes more difficult to make the calculation. You don't know which country the third country is going to join. Or if a fourth country, or if a fifth country. The mathematics of it is that you have an exponential increase in the complexity of calculating an outcome as you get more actors in a problem. That's the calculation problem. 
We live in a world of 200 and more countries. Imagine how complex it is for diplomats to coordinate a country's security relations. The second issue is the free rider problem. This is the problem of cheating. Countries are going to join an alliance and not pay, but they're going to get the benefits. This is also captured by the tragedy of the commons, where you have a group of countries cooperating over the distribution of a common good, but then they abuse that good. Number three, the sanctioning problem. If one of the countries cheats, to punish that country takes resources. It's not rational for a given country to go and then punish that free rider, because punishment itself requires coordinating action by the members of the alliance. So it's another collective action problem. So ultimately, the collective action problem predicts that most alliances will be minimum winning coalitions. States will seek to minimize costs and the coordination costs of the calculation problem, the free rider problem, the sanctioning problem, and will therefore seek the smallest possible alliance to achieve their security goals. So let's take a look at the First World War and the argument that it was the association of alliances that led the war to break out and then to escalate. And, you know, there's some argument for this, but it should be recognized that the First World War had many causes, and this is one of those causes. On June 28, 1914, in Sarajevo, there's the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand by a Serbian nationalist student. Austria-Hungary issues an ultimatum to Serbia that would effectively ended Serbian sovereignty. One month later, on July 28th, Austria-Hungary declares war on Serbia because of irredentist support by Serbs of uh, Serbs in Vojvodina in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Russia mobilizes against Austria-Hungary and Germany. They had to do this because Russia was an ally of Serbia and if they didn't mobilize they would have been seen to be abandoning allies. Germany decided therefore to attack France because France was an ally of Russia. So for Germany to defeat Russia, they would first have to defeat France. So Germany attacked France. But to attack France in a safe way, they wouldn't attack directly through the Lorraine, they would attack through Belgium. And so they swung their army through Belgium in a preemptive strike. So Germany attacked France before France could attack Germany. Now England had a very unclear deterrence policy with regard to Belgium. Belgium contained Europe's largest port at Antwerp and the English had traditionally wanted to neutralize Antwerp. So the British didn't warn Germany not to go through Belgium, but once the Germans went through Belgium, the British balanced against Germany and declared war. On August 23, 1914, Japan jackal bandwagoned. Because Germany had islands in the Pacific, Japan declared war on Germany and seized the German islands, principally the um, Marianas and the Caroline Islands. Japan then deployed a flotilla to the Eastern Mediterranean to help the Allies chase German submarines. On October 1914, the Ottoman joined Germany. The Ottoman Empire, which was under pressure from the English and the French, calculated that Germany would win. So it was a case of bad uh, bandwagoning calculation. May 23rd, 1915, Italy, after being neutral, was offered Tyrol, which is uh, a part of the Austrian-Italian Alps that Italy had claimed. So Italy joined the Allies against Austria and Germany in a form of good calculating bandwagoning. In the end, Italy joined the winning side and they were able to take possession of the Tyrol. Late in 1915, Bulgaria joined the war, primarily to counterbalance the Greeks who had the support of the English and the French. So it was logical balancing behavior. In the summer of 1916, Romania made a calculation that was very difficult. Germany was doing quite well against Russia Romania had very little hope of getting an ally to the region, but Romania wanted to get Transylvania from Hungary. 
So Romania declared war against the Austrians, the Hungarians, and the Germans, and it was very quickly defeated. But at the end of the war, because it had joined the Allies, the Allies granted it control of Transylvania. So this was a good, jack, a well-calculated jackal bandwagon. In April of 1917, the United States, because of threat to its commerce, and because of the Zimmerman telegram, where the Germans encouraged the Mexicans to invade the US, the US declared war on Germany. And so this is a function of balancing, moving against the biggest threat in the system to you. So let's look now at the balance of power. The balance of power theory has a long tradition and is one of the earliest theories of state behavior. Kautilya, who is an advisor of Chandragupta, and who probably wrote the treatise on the theory of the conduct of international relations, the Arthasastra, the Manual of Politics, has an excellent treatment on the logic of alliances. In fact, in that text, you have the famous dictum, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, which are originated in the Arthasastra. So you have alliances. The tacit alliance between the United States and communist China against the Soviet Union in 1971 is an example of two countries that are not friendly. The U.S. was anti-communist. China was anti-capitalist and certainly anti-Western. But the U.S. and China got together nonetheless against the Soviet Union because the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Now, in the traditional balance of power theory, we have an argument that in all systems, there's a general tendency for the weaker states to get together and ally together against the greatest emerging threat to the system. Therefore, the system is always in equilibrium and domination of the system by a single state is impossible. As a threat to the system is defeated and declines and a new threat emerges, states will then readjust their balancing and forge new alliances. We can see this, of course, with the end of the Cold War and the decline of Russia and the rise of China. We can see countries changing their alignments as a consequence. A balance of power system provides stability in three ways. One, the system retains all of its essential characteristics of governance, like you know the laws of commerce and international institutions, so that no single nation becomes dominant. Number two, that most of the members continue to survive. Number three, that large-scale war does not occur. Now, this rejects an assumption that we're going to see in a later lecture. So here we have a balance of power system. We have a number of uh, different uh, uh, circles that represent countries of different power and size. The actual way they combine, aside from the principle that countries balance against power, the precise way they, they join into alliances is actually indeterminate mathematically. And people have been looking for formula to try to make a prediction for a very long time. So once you have countries joined together, you know, there are some principles, which is they're going to search for a minimum winning coalition to simplify calculations. Uh, because they want to limit the amount of resources they, they spend and they want to maximize their influence in the organization and they have the collective action problem. Uh, but besides that, it's very indeterminate who's going to join what side. Now, one of the later theories we're going to see is called hegemonic stability theory. Balance of power rejects hegemonic stability's assumption that you always have a hegemon. The hegemon is a Greek term for the single greatest power in the system. Today, that would be characterized by, say, the United States. It's got an overwhelming economy. It has a huge cultural influence. It dominates global commerce and glo global security. And it's at the head of the most powerful alliances. Balance of power theory says the US is nothing special. It's not a hegemon. It's not even a superpower. It's simply a great power. So we will look later at uh, hegemonic stability theory. And you can make a comparison. Now, balance of power does seem to have a lot of validity. Repeated attempts to unify Europe have repeatedly failed because they provoked overwhelming blocking coalitions. So here we have a list of attempts to unify Europe, the Austro-Spanish uh, Habsburgs, and that lasted for a century with huge conflicts in Italy and in the cockpit of Europe, which is Belgium and Holland. Uh, Louis XIV's wars. He tried to expand all the way to Jerusalem, but was blocked by a coalition of Austrians, English, and Dutch. 
The Napoleonic Wars, which unified Europe for a while, but never overcame the resistance of England. The Wilhelmine Germans, that ultimately ended up in the First World War. And the attempt by Nazi Germany to create a new order in Europe. The balance of power also applies to India. India was never unified, specifically in, in its largest uh, pre-modern empires, it never contained the Chola Peninsula in the south. Chola is not weak. Chola is the center of global commerce that goes through the Indian Ocean from China to the Middle East to Europe. Genes come from uh, Chola. In fact, the reason denim became so popular in Europe was European sailors got to Chola and they saw all these wealthy Indians wearing cotton pants. And then they took them to uh, France where they got indigo and other dyes and then they changed them into blue jeans. Uh, Chola was powerful enough to invade and destroy the Indonesian empire of Majapahit with a giant navy. So India has a balance of power dynamic where however powerful the states in the north, they could never conquer the states in the south. Here we have other periods of um, states in South Asia and they never uh, quite achieved domination of the entire subcontinent. Now 18th century Europe typified balancing. This is the 1700s. 18th century Europe was uh, a, a, a balance of power example that is used as the, the ultimate case of countries shifting their alliances because of new emerging threats. Now in this period, there were eight major global powers at the time, including Manchu China, the Ottoman Empire, and Mughal India. But all of these were in relative decline, and they were isolated from each other because of the European domination of the oceans. There was, all, of course, the Nadir Shah's Iran. They had tried to build a navy, but uh, their navy was destroyed by the Europeans. And then you had the main European states, England, France, Russia, Spain, and Austria. So this is the distribution of power in the world the oceans controlled by the Europeans. So in Europe, there were, of course, England, France, Russia, Spain, and Austria, all of which except Austria had a military reach outside of Europe. Each of the wars in Europe, therefore, were accompanied by wars on other continents, typically in North America, on the African coast, in India, and uh, later on in the Far East. So let's take a look at some of these wars. The first war was the War of the Spanish Succession, 1701 to 1714. The war was fought over control of the Spanish throne. France and Spain opposed England, Austria, and Holland and were accompanied by Queen Anne's War in North America. So here you can see the countries on the different side. There followed the War of the Quadruple Alliance. 1718 to 1720. The war was fought over the succession in France. Here we have England, France, and Holland opposing Spain. Here you can see the two general alliances. There followed then the war of the Polish succession, 1733 to 1738. The war was over the succession in Poland. It was France, Spain, and Sardinia against Austria and Russia. Here again are the two sides. There followed then the War of the Austrian Succession, 1740 to 1748. The war was over the succession in Austria, and you had France, Spain, and Prussia versus Austria and England. This was accompanied by the First Carnatic War in India between England and France, and King George's War in North America between the uh, English and the French uh, settlers. There then followed the Seven Years' War of 1756 to 1763. Austria, France, Russia, Sweden, and Saxony opposed Prussia and England. It was accompanied by the French and Indian War in North America and by the Anglo-French War in India. And here you can see the two different sides. So what's the key observation that could be made of the 18th century period? It's it's a period that's typified as the balance of power period because states changed sides frequently as it suited them. 
the same phenomenon occurred in other parts of Europe. If you were to do a study of the Baltic between uh, Sweden and Russia and Denmark and the other countries there, Poland, you would see the same dynamic of constant changing alliances. So for example, England fought both with and against France and Austria. Now this is not a sign of inconsistency. It's a sign of good statecraft. England's policy was to oppose any state from becoming preponderant in continental Europe with the idea that this would lead to an eventual invasion of England. And England's been obsessed about avoiding invasion from mainland Europe. In fact, the only time England was threatened by invasion was by the Spanish Armada in 1588, Louis XIV and Napoleon and Adolf Hitler. And the rest of the times you had smaller invasions by the Spanish or French in um, Ireland and you had threats of invasion. Um, but most of the time, uh, England was quite successful at neutralizing the invasion attempt by engaging in balance of power politics on the continent. So what are some of the criticisms of balance of power theory? Well, first of all, there's a problem of trade-offs between the goals of a balance of power system. So you could, you could have a war to stop the domination of the system. I mean, this is the whole logic of World War II. There was a tremendous war fought to stop the Nazis from expanding. So clearly the balance of power system failed in the lead up to the Second World War. Number two, you could have domination of a system to stop the war. I mean, uh, one of the U.S. grand strategy goals is to democratize the world, essentially influence the world using its own liberal form of domestic politics before nuclear weapons spread. Because if nuclear weapons spread while there are still authoritarian militarized governments, we could have a giant nuclear war in the future. So it makes sense sometimes to dominate the system to avoid war. Number three, you could have a war to prevent the conquest of smaller powers. The U.S. intervened to protect Kuwait against Saddam Hussein's Iraq. England declared war to protect Poland. Number four, you could engage in conquest to preserve the characteristics of the system. This is the Brezhnev Doctrine. The Soviet Union invaded Czechoslovakia in 1968 as a warning to other communist countries not to liberalize in order to preserve the balance of the system. Now, some argue that the balance of power only works under special conditions. It's not a universal observation. One, you have to have moderate competitive behavior among the states, typically caused by religious or cultural restraint. The 18th century was no accident. In the century before, the 17th century, you had a violent war called the Thirty Years' War, which involved most of the countries of Central Europe. Germany's population was reduced from 24 million to 16 million. They lost a third of their people in the violence. The Thirty Years' War was a religious war between Catholics and Protestants. But by the end of the war, it had basically delegitimized religion. The war concluded with the Treaty of Westphalia in 1848, and the Pope was not invited to the peace negotiations. Europeans shifted their allegiance from the religion which was a part of their identity, and then shifted instead their, their allegiance to the state. And so we have the modern system born. So the 18th century, a century later, there was moderation. People no longer wanted to fight to the death over religious principles. Number two, you have to have a norm against the annihilation of states. Spain was uh, eventually ground down during the Habsburg period. Uh, Louis XIV's France was uh, fought uh, to the point of exhaustion. Germany was defeated in World War, World War I and World War II. The uh, Russians at the end of the Cold War were, well, dismantled from the perspective of their influence in the Warsaw Pact. But all of these states were reincorporated into the international system. None of them were destroyed. If you start destroying states in the international system, you're going to shrink how many states there are in the system, undermining the balance of power dynamic, and you're going to create empires. Number three, there should be no impediments to the free balancing of states, such as pacifism or democracy. Pacifism, which was a reaction to the violence of World War I and the high costs paid by European societies in, in obeying what were mostly either authoritarian or mercantile leaderships, uh, led to the rise of Hitler, 
and led to the failure of deterrence. People didn't want another war, and so they didn't stand up and stop Hitler early on. Also, democracy. Democracies are famous for not engaging in preventative war. There's one uh, exception, which is the U.S. attack on Iraq in 2003, in which the U.S. moved to prevent Iraq from eventually developing nuclear weapons. Not really a credible argument, but it was cheaper for the U.S. to invade Iraq and dismantle it than for the U.S. to keep it under siege forever. So if you have a democracy and a rising power like the rise of China, uh, the U.S. is not going to act until China invades Taiwan. Now, um, breaking into letter values, A, Critics argue that the balance of power system is dysfunctional because it often requires an invulnerable neutral state like England to repeatedly join the weaker side. So England is an offshore balancer. It floats off on the coast of Europe and it intervenes and picks whichever side is weakest and backs them. If you look at Asia, Japan never played the role of balancer. It played the role of intervener. It would invade through Korea into China. And so it was constantly hostile to everyone on the continent. On the other hand, when China was invaded by Japan in the 1930s, almost one third of all Chinese soldiers in China were fighting with the Japanese against other Chinese. So China, Japan has played uh, the role of offshore balancer, but it wasn't always to keep the states in Asia independent. A criticism of the balance of power theory is that it often requires an invulnerable offshore balancer. And without it, the system would become dysfunctional because you would end up with hegemony achieved on the mainland. The classic example of this is the United Kingdom during the long history of modern Europe. The English constantly intervened onto the continent with the one strategic goal of never allowing any single country to unify Europe. Because the English logic was, if that were to happen, then England would no longer be able to resist an invasion. This was the US strategy also, transplanted from Europe to all of Eurasia. So the U.S. grand strategy has always been to ensure that there's not one single dominating power in the Eurasian landmass stretching from Europe in the west to China in the east and all the countries in between. And there's, of course, a great deal of speculation about why, for example, Japan never became an offshore balancer with respect to China. And uh, it's thought perhaps because it's not quite as close to the European continent or because the main population centers like Tokyo and the plains where they're established are actually looking out towards the Pacific and not looking in towards the continent. Uh, but uh, it is a big question whether an offshore balancer is required to maintain the functioning of a balance of power system. The second observation, which is B, is that the balance of power does not always succeed. Sometimes multi-state regions do unify. China's the classic example. During the Warring States period, the state of Qin, which is depicted uh, as deep red in the map on the right, and as uh, sort of a darker color on the extreme uh, uh, west border in the map on the left, Qin started to consume the states one by one until it brought all of uh, Zhang Guo together. And Europeans went to visit and uh, they visited at the time that uh, Zhang Guo was unified. And so Europeans called China, China from Qin. So we have a research puzzle here, which is why did China unify where Europe and India did not? Was it for particular geographic or technological reasons? Tin Bo Hui, uh, wrote an article on that in as a part of her book, and I think it's in your reader. It did fail in Europe. The Romans were able to unify Europe around the Mediterranean, and there was no substantial urbanized power that resisted them. You had the Dacians for a short while, you had, of course, the Parthians that were uh, quite distant, uh, but there was no other urbanized challenger to the Romans. 
Of course, periodically, China is broken up again. So maybe the balance of power does work in some way in China, uh, but it only works sometimes when whatever factors allow China to unify, uh, allow it to break apart. Now, C consideration. It, it's possible that the balance of power applies only to land warfare. So it applies to continents like Europe. It applies to um, yeah, East Asia. And so it cannot explain the tendency for global naval hegemony. Naval hegemony depends on the oceans. It depends on the observation that it's very easy to move across the oceans. So if you have a fleet and someone else has a fleet, it's easy for the two fleets to meet and for the stronger to defeat the weaker. On land, movement is much more difficult. So if you have a lot of power, you have enormous costs just to cover a short distance. So if you look at the world today, the US Navy is so powerful, it could probably declare war on every other floating object and win. The US has 10 fleet carriers. The US has 10 amphibious carriers. That's 20 aircraft carriers. Its competitors are China with three, Russia with one, Thailand, which recently got rid of theirs, Spain with one, Italy with one, France with one, England with two, Brazil with one. So the US has more aircraft carriers than the rest of the world put together. So it's possible that hegemony theory, which we're going to look at later on, applies to the naval dimension of global power, and balance of power applies to the terrestrial dimension of power. And D, balance of power is a theory to explain the absence of terrestrial hegemony, but it doesn't explain peace. In fact, for balance of power to work, you have to have a lot of war. When people say that balance of power uh, brings peace, they're making a promise that's not genuine. Balance of power needs to enforce itself against threats. And those threats don't always understand that an alliance is there to deter them. Now, a major cause of overexpansion is the misperception of the balance of power. Specifically, there is a belief that the international system operates not according to the balancing principle, but according to the bandwagoning principle. In a bandwagoning world, strength attracts allies. It causes states to submit through bandwagoning. And this then spreads like dominoes and leads to spheres of influence. Louis XIV bullied his neighbors in the Rhineland. Napoleon did the same. Hitler did the same to Eastern Europe. To some extent, all of these leaders believed that the world was operating according to the bandwagoning pr principle and that aggression and threats would be rewarded. We think today of the way that China is behaving towards its neighbors, Vietnam, Philippines, Taiwan, Japan, South Korea, Mongolia, pa uh, uh, India, so and Myanmar. So, I mean, there's uh, uh, issues there with China's belief in a bandwagoning environment. China's clearly trying to create an exclusive sphere of influence. Now these states therefore behave very aggressively thinking that they could intimidate states to bandwagon with them and not balance against them. Instead, their aggressive behavior provoked an overwhelming coalition of all the other states in the region. If you think about it today, China how many allies does it have? It has an ally of convenience in Pakistan, but Pakistan is not an atheist communist state. It's a democracy. Many Pakistani uh, elites understand the West better than they do China. North Korea is a very opportunistic state, but it balances between China and uh, Russia. It, it's obviously seeking independence from China. Myanmar is clearly a bandwagoner. Perhaps there's Zimbabwe, minor countries that also challenge the system like China does. In the 1930s, it seemed Hitler was right at first. His intimidation slowed down the process of coordinated balancing so that France and England and Poland and Russia and Czechoslovakia were unprepared to fight Germany. Russia should have had an alliance with France, but they were concerned for over ideological reasons. France should have protected Czechoslovakia, but for a moment of additional years of peace, they basically abandoned Czechoslovakia. So these countries created their uh, coalition slower than Hitler could intimidate them into separating from the coalition. Now, there are many causes of this misperception. 
uh, and we're going to take a look at some of these.